Hey everyone, we're going to wrap up our semester long exploration of various concepts in biology with the nervous system. Um, the nervous system is made up of a variety of cells, but one of the champions of the nervous system is a cell called a neuron. And a neuron looks something like this. So there is a part of the neuron which is called the cell body. And the cell body is the part that's the classic cell part is the way of I thinking thinking about it. It's got the nucleus in it. It has a lot of the the same types of organelles that other cells have. And in addition to the cell body, though, there are these unique uh, features of a neuron that make it different than other cells. One of those is that it has these um, branches, which are called the dendrites. And the dendrites are like the receiving. And they, what you could think of is, uh, they could, you could think of it as that they receive electrical chemical signals. In other words, they receive electricity, so to speak. <clears throat> now, at the dendrites, there's this big tug of war that happens. Um, there will be other neurons attached to these dendrites. Some will be uh, charging them up. Others will be uh, taking away the charge. And there's this tug of war between charges to try and ultimately either inhibit or uh, initiate what's known as an action potential. And an action potential is basically a change in voltage that sweeps along the, the axon. <clears throat> and this is the way that these cells communicate. So this thing here is called the axon. It's this really long uh, extension of a neuron. And it can vary in its length. It can be actually super long relative to the size of the cell. It could be a several feet long, or it could be uh, only a, a few micrometers long. It, there's a huge variance in neurons in your body. But in either case, this is like the wire of the cell. Even if we think about these cells forming somewhat like an electrical wire, this is the part that is the wire. And this is going to transmit a change in voltage that sweeps across here known as an action potential. It will only do that if the tug of war is such at the dendrites that will then sweep, you know, the if the, there's some signals that will be stimulatory, others will be inhibitory. Those are all uh, acting on the dendrites. And if, if the, the nature is such that the stimulatory signals win out in that tug of war, then it's like firing the trigger of a gun. It shoots the action potential down the axon. It will go all the way down then to these, which are the terminals. And then neurotransmitters will be released by the terminals. And then they usually are going to be a synapsed with some other structure. So the neurotransmitters will be released. They'll go and bind to some other structure. And if it's that other structure is a neuron, then it will start the whole thing over again. Okay, it's it would be neurotransmitters that are released in binding to the dendrites, which are causing them to either um, be stimulatory or be inhibitory. And so you can see that this then just repeats. And so the way that I think about it is neurons are somewhat like dominoes. In the same way, you can push a domino down and it will start a chain reaction uh, that goes from one end all the way to the other. <clears throat> That's how neurons are in a way. You can, you can, if there's enough force, so to speak, to get one to fire, it will start a chain of reaction. And as long as the force that it's exerting on the subsequent domino or the subsequent neuron is strong enough, the, the neuron will send an action potential and then it will transfer to the next one and then to the next one and to the next one. And then it can spread out throughout a whole a uh, network of neurons to go to different places and do different things. All right, so that's a little bit about what we got going on here. Um, now, there is something that's required to prime neurons so that they can respond to uh, electrochemical signals. They can res respond to neurotransmitters binding it, and they can either charge them up or, or discharge them. And the reason why they are able to respond in this unique way is that they have what's known as a resting membrane potential. Now, this word potential, it just means voltage, okay? In the same way that um, there is, let's say, the potential for you to um, create energy and do something by plugging in a cord into an outlet, there's also 
uh, potential energy that exists across the membrane of a neuron. <clears throat> the, the definition of voltage is the potential for electrical charges to come together and thereby do something when they do. And that's exactly what happens when you're plugging something into an outlet. There is a voltage that exists, and if you connect the pathway so that current can flow through it, it will. And when you put those two prongs into the outlet, you're connecting the circuit, so now electrons can flow through the wires, and then they can actually uh, do something, whatever, whatever it is that you're plugging in can turn on. Well, in the same way, you have these, uh, this voltage across the membrane, and if it's allowed to come together, it will, can be used to do work. So, in any case, all that, all that this means is that at rest, there is a voltage across the membrane. Okay, so if I looked at this picture, uh, generally the way that it works is that on the outside of the, um, on the outside there's a positive charge, and on the inside there's a negative charge. And the particles that form these charges aren't able to come together with one another. If they could, it wouldn't be voltage. Voltage means that there is positively charged stuff, and then there's negatively charged stuff. And even though they want to come together, they're separated out. They can't. And uh, only when they are allowed to come together can they then come together. And that's the situation we have here. There is a voltage at rest across the membrane. It's the resting membrane potential. And this is what's responsible for a lot of the behavior of neurons. Um, for example, um, <clears throat> if these are allowed to come together, the charge dissipates, and then that sends off a whole cascade of events which transfer all the way down the axon. Now, what specifically those events are, we won't get into that type of detail in this class, but uh, it is a pretty fascinating Thing that happens. So there are there are two things that can happen here. There can be what's known as a depolarization of the membrane of the voltage, or there can be a repolarization of the membrane. And the reason molecular basis for this is again quite complicated. But for our purposes, just know that when we say depolarization, we mean um, like a, a discharge of the battery. It's like the voltage is dissipating. If you think about neurons being like a battery, and <clears throat> then when they're when they're being discharged, it would be like uh, using up a battery that you're using for some tool. Okay, repolarization then would be like charging the battery, and neurons are constantly being depolarized, meaning they're expelling their energy and then they're constantly being repolarized they're constantly being charged back up so they dissipate their voltage they charge back up they dissipate their voltage they charge back up and in the whole process it ends up being this elaborate uh, system that is used by the body to detect uh, signals and transfer those signals from one place so for example you stimulate the neuro the the receptor of a tactile you stimulate the the tactile receptor of a somewhere on your skin, it will have a series of, of voltages that get passed from neuron to neuron to neuron to neuron, and it goes all the way up to your brain. And then you can detect it as, oh, something's touching my skin. It's a really rapid form of communication that's happening in your nervous system. Now, there is um, a difference between what are called graded potentials and action potentials. We said an action potential is the change in voltage that sweeps across the axon. Okay, think about it being like a gun that's firing, and it's firing a signal that goes all the way down. It's an all-or-nothing event, and um, if it happens, it happens, and it happens all the way through, and if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen at all. That's different than what's known as a graded potential. Graded potentials are the changes in voltage experienced here at the dendrites, and uh, again, some are stimulatory, some are inhibitory, and they will battle each other out, and if there's enough stimulatory signals to outcompete the inhibitory signals, then uh, the trigger, the molecular trigger, so to speak, is squeezed right about right here in the cell, and then that will shoot an action potential down. So these can get weaker or stronger. Um, they they uh, can intensify or, or not, and then they would lead to the production of this, which is the thing that sweeps across. All right, so that's the sort of the molecular underpinning in the 
<clears throat> microanatomy of the central nervous system. It has to do a lot with these electrochemical uh, things that are happening in these cells called neurons. And looking more macroscopically then at the anatomy, here's how the how the nervous system is partitioned. There is what's known as the central nervous system. And the central nervous system would be the spinal cord and the brain. Okay. Contrast that to the peripheral nervous system. The peripheral nervous system is all of the nerves that come off of either the spinal cord or the brain stem. And those would be the things that are going in innervating specific spots, whether it be specific muscles or glands or things throughout your body. Um, looking at the brain, specifically the anatomy here, <clears throat> this is part of the central nervous system. Here's a sagittal section of what the brain looks like. Here we're seeing the spinal cord. The spinal cord is part of the central nervous system, but it's not technically considered part of the brain. Once we get through this hole in the skull that the spinal cord passes, now we're talking about the brain. And so the first part of the brain then is the, this thing we're seeing here. This is the brain stem. And it's one of four major parts of the brain. And there's additional substructures in here too, which we won't really cover all that much. Okay, this is part one of the brain. Another part of the brain is this little bump that you see off the back. And this is called the cerebellum. And the cerebellum is uh, is called the little brain. That's what the word means. And it's going to be something that helps with your balance and your, equilib your equilibrium, your sense of positioning and, and how it relates to your movements. The cerebellum is uh, in a strategic location because it's right next to a lot of the signals that are coming in and out of the brain. So it can, in a way, monitor that activity and, and jump in and alter things when needed, specifically related to your positioning and your body movements. Okay, uh, right in the middle then of your brain is a part that's called the diencephalon. And in it, um, there are a couple of structures, but one of the notable ones are these two nuggets called the thalami. You have a right and a left thalamus. And you can't really see them here because this is a sagittal section, but I'll just draw one in here. So this is about where a thalamus would sit. And the thalami are important structures because they're like relay switches. A lot of the information coming up into your brain first stops at the thalamus, and then it synapses on a bunch of neurons, which then route it out to different parts of the brain. So it's like a switching board. Um, then the fourth part of your brain then is this big portion which you probably generally think of when you think of a brain, this is the cerebrum. And uh, the cerebrum is composed of a bunch of folds. You have uh, these the folds of nervous tissue. They increase the, um, uh, the surface area. And the tops of the folds are called gyri. And the troughs, or the valleys of the folds, are called sulci. And uh, there are different things happening in different folds, like uh, it's thought that the folds here are more involved in your consciousness and your reasoning and things like that. The folds here are involved in sending uh, motor commands to your skeletal muscles, so issuing uh, signals that go to your muscles and actually cause them to contract. Just behind that are some folds that are thought to be uh, an important place where your sensory information is coming, so any of the touch information or the pain or the thermo uh, information coming from receptors in your skin. It all lands here. And then in the back, uh, this is where a lot of your visual information goes to. And so somebody that maybe slips and falls on the ice and hits their head uh, pretty hard on the, on the sidewalk, they could actually have some, some da uh, damage to their visual acuity or maybe even partial blindness or complete blindness, depending on the severity of the injury. Um, so each of these regions has sort of been mapped out and has a, a characteristic feature to it. Now there are two cerebral hemispheres. There's one on the left and the one on the right. And this has spurned a lot of you know, discussion about what it means to be either left-brained or right-brained, and I should put maybe quotes here, that it was thought that uh, there are some people that have different proclivities. Some people are better at doing like verbal reasoning and reading. Other people are better at uh, like three-dimensional uh, orientation and arrangement of objects in their mind's eye. 
and uh, some you know some people are more creative and artistic, others are more analytical and and rational. It's thought that maybe um, your proclivity to being one or one way or another maybe has some roots in which side of the brain you predominantly use. Um, I'm not entirely sure of the validity of this, but I mean it is a common uh, a common conception that people have that they're either right brained or left brain. And some of the scientific analyses that rot these convictions come from this gentleman here, Roger W. Sperry, and he was a psychologist studying uh, this sort of thing. And basically what he did is he would uh, conduct experiments in, in patients who had had their corpus callosum severed. So the corpus callosum is this little structure here that uh, allows the two sides of the cerebral hemispheres to talk to one another. And in these patients, it was severed. Be generally, it's severed uh, because it was some sort of treatment for um, epilepsy. Okay, so they'd had this treatment completed, so then now their brain was severed. And so what was happening then is that information coming from the left eye would be routed over to the right side of the brain. Information from the right eye would be routed over to the left side of the brain. And uh, what he would do is he would show uh, two words, project them on a screen. And then in addition to that, there would be this little surface where various objects that were uh, representations of these words would be found. So for example, this word maybe here said key, and this word over here said maybe uh, pen, and then there would actually be a key and a pen on there. And when asked uh, what one of the words was on one of the sides, they could clearly say this is the word, and then when they are asked to point to it, they wouldn't be able to point to it. And then on the flip side, on the other side, if they asked what the word was, they had no recollection of what the word was. It was almost like they were blind they couldn't see the word, but very curiously enough, if asked to point to the object that they saw, even though they couldn't, uh, they couldn't tell the word that they saw, they were able to point to it. So it was like their ability to communicate language was lacking in that part of the brain, but still they were able to recognize the spatial visual characteristics of the object. Um, and this is a summary from the paper basically saying, uh, visual, visual material projected on the right half of the field can be described in speech and written essentially in a normal fashion. However, the same material is projected on the left half of the field, so going over to the right brain. The subject consistently insists that he didn't see anything. But the most bizarre part of it all, if asked to tell you what he saw, you he can use his left hand to point to the matching picture or object. Um, so a really uh, interesting set of studies that are done by Roger Sperry. Okay, and there's been others since too that either lend support or, or even maybe dispute some of these findings. But um, so you maybe you're maybe left brained or right brained, um, and I can't remember which one is thought to do what, but it's an interesting study nonetheless. Okay, other parts of the brain of interest. There's a, a pituitary gland right here, and this is. Um, one of the endocrine organs and another thing that I'll point out is that the uh, corpus callosum is right here just above the diencephalon and this is the thing that was severed in those experiments and another unique feature of the brain is that it sits suspended in this bath of fluid which is called cerebral spinal fluid it's made uh, somewhat in the middle of the brain and then it, it it goes out and spreads out to different parts of the brain and this is actually continuous all the way down the spinal cord so the the fluid that accumulates here in the middle of the brain it goes down this thing called the cerebral aqueduct and then it passes all the way down the spinal cord down 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 and then it from there it can get out and now it it actually bathes uh, and nourishes the entire spinal cord around it um, an interesting thing that can happen here is is uh, some women when they are getting an epidural, which is a shot in their lower back to help numb the pain in childbirth. Um, generally, the needle doesn't go so far that it punctures the membrane that contains the cerebral spinal fluid, but occasionally it will pop through there and then the cerebral spinal fluid starts leaking out. And so it starts actually draining uh, the brain case, so to speak. There's a, a depletion in fluid and it can lead to really excruciating headaches. 
Um, and a woman would know that this is the case if she lays down and the headaches go away and then as soon as she stands up, the headaches return. That would be an indication that it's something to do with the, the level of cerebral spinal fluid. And um, it would make one suspect that the epidural needle maybe was inserted too far and actually punctured the membrane. Then they actually have to go in and inject some blood from the, from the, the mother in there and it will coagulate and patch the hole. It's called the blood patch. Um, but yeah, cerebral spinal fluid is very similar to blood plasma, but it has a couple of unique uh, restrictions to it. It's, there's a, actually a blood-brain barrier that make it such that um, not all the things in the blood can pass into the cerebral spinal fluid. Okay, um, <clears throat> now if we looked at the very surface of the cerebrum, here's all those folds that I was talking about. And what you're seeing here, this is called Broadman's map. And this is actually the map that was created by uh, a physiologist or a histologist who was studying uh, pieces of the brain under a microscope and looking just at the shapes of the neurons. And he would notice there were some patterns and he actually created a map to show where some of the morphology of the neurons would change into these different regions. In this convention, actually, we still use uh, mostly today. So it's it's amazing how accurate this was depend, based on the fact that it was made over 100 years ago. Um, and that just is, sort of lends credence to the idea that it's the, the morphology or the anatomy of a structure which often confers its function or its physiology. But in either case, um, a couple of unique regions here that can be found. This one right here is called the precentral gyrus, and this is going to issue motor commands. And then just behind that, this is called the postcentral gyrus, and this is going to receive uh, sensory information from your skin. Um, there is uh, a region here called Broadman's region, and that's responsible for production of language. There's the visual uh, area here that where our visual information comes from. There's auditory cortex that receives um, information. There's Wernicke's region that has to do with um, understanding language. So the part of your brain that produces language and the part of your brain that, that understands and comprehends uh, language are two different parts. And here's sort of a summary of, of that map. And we don't have to go into too much detail here uh, in this class, but I just want to generally show you that where we are in this cortex of the cerebrum has different functions. Okay, uh, another interesting thing specifically about the postcentral gyrus, the place where your sensory information comes from, is that you can actually map it out and in, it forms what we call a somatosensory homunculus. So it looks like this. Um, there are, depending on where the in the body the stimulus is coming from, it will get routed to a specific pot spot along that gyrus. So, for example, if uh, your toes were being touched, it would light up a, a part right about, uh, light up the gyrus right here in this location. If your arms were being touched, it would be generally somewhere around here. If your hand was being touched, it would, you, we would detect that somewhere on this part of the gyrus, and then your face would be further down. So it's all mapped out, and that's one of the ways that your body can more or less code uh, where the stimulus is coming from. And that's a really great thing, right? It's, it, would be, it would be somewhat sad if uh, your body only had the ability to detect if it was being touched or not, and so it would just be like an on and off switch. Um, but that's not, our, our perception of, of tactile sensory experience is much more complicated than that. Not only can you determine if you're touched or not, you can determine where you're being touched, and you can also determine uh, how forcefully or the level of intensity of the touch. That involves all sorts of complicated uh, sensors uh, scattered throughout your skin, and it all gets routed and mapped to your brain, and, and that is what helps to distinguish a touch, let's say, that's coming from your leg versus a touch, let's say, that's on your nose. Okay, then lastly, uh, one, one little tale here. This is the tale of Phineas Gage. And Phineas Gage is somewhat of a, an anomaly in the medical community. Um, his story is that he was working on the railroad, and specifically his job would be to bore holes into the rock 
fill them with gunpowder and then tamp it down and then uh, blow it up. And that's how they would blow up big parts of rock and carve out uh, tunnels and things for the railroad. And on one occasion, he had put the gunpowder in and he was tamping it in uh, with the tamping iron, which is actually what you're seeing right here. This big iron thing was put in the hole to, to pack down the gunpowder. And he was standing over that hole and something happened where it, a spark was created uh, or something, but it set the gunfire, the gunpowder ablaze, and it shot this uh, tamping iron right through his skull. Um, and basically blew a big hole right into his brain and out the other side. And most people would think that this would be you know, pretty much lights out at that point. But um, some co-workers brought him down to a physician. The physician cleaned the wound. He had to scrape some of the brains away and uh, uh, treat him, treat it and bandage it up. And um, Phineas Gage is reported to have said that uh, he does not care to see his friends as he shall be to work in a few days. <laughs> so a different, different breed back there in the 1800s. You get a tamping arm blown through your brains and uh, you don't really want to see anybody because you're just going to get up and go to work the next day. Uh, well, unfortunately for Phineas Gage, this wasn't the case. His, his wound got worse. It started to inflame and uh, it started to get infected and there was periodically cleaning that was required. The brains would actually somewhat ooze out of the hole and they'd have to scrape them off and and treat it and bandage it and he went unconscious for a while but eventually did come out of it and uh, lived a fairly normal life afterwards. I mean I think if you read some of the reports his friends thought maybe he wasn't quite the same but still uh, highly functional uh, in a lot of respects and uh, sort of an interesting case study here and and the uh, the power of the brain to, to continue on even despite that type of level of, of trauma. Okay, well that's a little survey of the nervous system and in the next part we'll tackle actually some of the interesting facets of mind-body, uh, the mind-body problem. Uh, we as humans are very curious organisms and I would argue quite distinct in the world and uh, I think a lot of the root for that gets into something that's going on with the nervous system. Uh, there's sort of a boundary there between the uniqueness that makes us human and then also the machine that is more animalistic. And uh, and this presents in a variety of ways which we'll sort of explore, but it's, it's more of a, a philosophical uh, lecture, but at the same time I think some really important philosophical uh, applications and, and thoughts to consider to pair along with sort of the mechanistic approach that we're looking at here in this lecture. In either case, uh, that will wrap us up then for the entire course. Uh, we're going to end on the nervous system and some of the unique uh, component or unique concepts to discuss about it. And stay tuned for the next lecture.